This is CBN News Watch. And welcome to CBN News Watch. Once again, we've got a lot to get to today. We begin in the Middle East, where Iran's president has warned the, in, the tiniest invasion by Israel would bring a massive and harsh response. That threat coming as Israel considers potential targets for a strike, including nuclear facilities, weapons factories, and launch sites for missiles and drones. Chris Mitchell brings us the story now from Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu explained to young military recruits why Israel must respond to Iran's attack. Iran stands behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, behind others. But we're determined to win there and defend ourselves in all arenas. Analysts speculate Israel could hit Iranian nuclear facilities or factories and launch sites that made the drone and missile attack possible. Firing 110 ballistic missiles directly to Israel will not get scot-free. We will respond in our time, in our place, in the way that we will choose. On Tuesday, the IDF displayed one of the more than 100 ballistic missiles fired at Israel. These uh, ballistic missiles are ones that has 500 kilos of explosives in the warhead. We are talking about over 110 ballistic missiles coming from Iran aiming towards Israel. These are 60 tons of explosives directly to Israel. On the diplomatic front, the U.S. continues to pressure Israel against a retaliatory strike and has announced it's ready to apply economic sanctions against Iran's missile and drone program. Critics point out that the Biden administration has waived such sanctions in the past. We lifted or waived the sanctions that we had, this administration, on the drones and, and the missiles and on the energy. This is giving them $100 billion in cash to fund their terror operations. And that's why we're seeing this. Senior policy advisor for the U.S.-Israel Education Association, Ari Sakra, says most citizens want to send Iran a message. Israelis, I believe, think that we need to return fire. Iran cannot be let off with a tongue lashing for, for what they did. There must be a price for impinging upon the security of a sovereign nation. Sakar believes, like many here in Israel, that divine intervention was at work during the attack. I have an axiomatic belief in the existence of a God, a God who pays attention and who cares, especially about what goes on in Israel. And everything I see reinforces that belief. So when I see 99% um, of, um, of rockets that are fired at Israel, of uh, threats, missiles, cruise missiles that are fired at Israel being shot down, um, I wake up the next morning and I thank God for it. Chris Mitchell joins us now with more from Jerusalem. So, Chris, has Israel definitely decided to go ahead with a strike against Iran? <clears throat> Uh, definitely, uh, they have, Ephraim. It's really not a question of if they're going to go, but when. Uh, you know, somebody told me uh, just recently the rules of engagement in this region are when you're hit, you need to hit back. Uh, anything less than that really projects weakness uh, and an invitation for more attacks. Uh, April 13th, just a few days ago, really was a paradigm shift here in the region. And the IDF says it's really going to be a time and place of their choosing, uh, but an attack really is a must for Israel. Uh, but they, they need to be smart about it, some people say, and they want to deter Iran. But on the other hand, they don't want to provoke a regional war. So the IDF and the war cabinet right now are really making a decision uh, on how they're going to respond uh, and when, but they, they, they want to be wise about it. Now you say it's not a matter of if but when. What are you hearing about the timing of a response and why? Well, the timing might be uh, taking some time to build a coalition against Iran. Uh, really, what happened on uh, April 13th was the fact that uh, a really unprecedented coalition against Iran. You had Abraham Accord nations, you had Jordan, you had uh, uh, France, the UK, and, and Israel, as well as the US. Uh, so they may want to build this regional support and take time. Uh, they also want to put Iran off guard and uh, keep uh, them unsure of where and when Israel is going to strike. As one 
uh, expert put it, let the Iranian simmer for, for a while. Another possibility is they might wait till after Passover, which uh, starts in a few days. It's a major holiday here in Israel. And also other reasons why they may wait just a bit is prioritize Rafa down in the Gaza Strip. You know, just a few days ago, we were talking about Rafa, and that was a real priority. Now we're talking about Iran. And then maybe uh, if they go to Rafa, and then maybe they would wait to go and uh, deal with Hezbollah. But on the other hand, on the bottom line, Ephraim, is they really have no choice uh, but to respond. And many of people here are saying, you really can't go back to the same paradigm after April 13th, when for the first time in 45 years, Iran directly attacked uh, the state of Israel. What has been Iran's strategy of um, death by a thousand cuts? Well, that's what some people say is that when uh, is Iran has been surrounding Israel with all its proxies, that's also called the Ring of Fire. You have Hezbollah in the north, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the Houthis down in Yemen, and you have these Iranian-backed militias in Syria and Iraq. The whole idea behind all these proxies is to drain Israel economically and even psychologically, and in effect to make Israel unlivable. Uh, but many say this is what goes against what many believe God is doing here. Uh, in the last 150 years or so, that he's been bringing his chosen people back from the four corners of the world that's been prophesied by the Hebrew prophets thousands of years ago. So you could say that Iran is really trying to stop or go against uh, God's plan. And if you look at history, it doesn't work out so well. There's a T-shirt here, Ephraim, that says, uh, you know, when you go through all the history and the empires that have come against the Jewish people, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, the Nazis, they're all gone, but the Jewish people remain. And uh, as someone once told me uh, many years ago, uh, God bet long on the Jews. The Biden administration is talking about sanctions against Iran. Does the Israeli government believe that will be enough? No, as Congressman McCall pointed out, they, they can be waived, and, and we've seen many of these uh, sanctions waived over the course of the Biden administration. Uh, if you look back at the end of the Trump administration, uh, Iran economically was really on the ropes. Uh, so, you know, right now it seems like the Biden administration is fueling the economy uh, of Iran. We're working on a story right now where the U.S. waived a sanction uh, of Iraq and Iran uh, Iran sells electricity to Iraq, but the sanctions was that they can't pay Iran. Well, they, they freeze that up, and that freed up about $10 billion. So it's a policy that fuels the terror activities in the region. Uh, and if you add up all the sale, the sanctions waived on the sale of oil, it, it adds up to billions and billions of dollars. Chris, while the focus is on, on Iran, at least for now, how is the war against Hamas going in Gaza? Well, there's signs, actually, that the operation in Rafa is going on. There's been incremental signs uh, that, that they're preparing to go into Rafa, uh, that the IDF is building up its forces. They're also increasing humanitarian aid going into the Gaza Strip. And, and they're also uh, operating in parts of Gaza, even as we speak right now. So while the attention is on Iran, Israel still has a focus of eliminating Hamas. And, uh, and by the way, Ephraim, the, uh, the hostage deal seems to be on hold for right now. Even the State Department is saying that demands by Hamas are simply unrealistic. They're asking for the end of the war for just simply 20 hostages. All right, Chris Mitchell reporting for us from Jerusalem. Thank you for your insights. As always, stay safe and know that we back here are praying for you and our entire team there in Israel. Coming up, how Hezbollah has used Christian farms in southern Lebanon to target Israel. We're going to bring you that story. It's coming up when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. This week we've been telling you about the major threat Israel is facing from Hezbollah. Just as Hamas uses human shields, Hezbollah is using similar tactics in its attacks on northern Israel. Evidence shows hidden weapons in densely populated areas, hoping Israel would hit those locations. In this exclusive report, George Thomas traveled to southern Lebanon to show us how the terrorist group has used Christian farms in that region to target Israel. 
Three kilometers from here, you can see my village there. You can see my olive orchards, my pine trees, and my pecan trees. They get shelled every day since the beginning of war. Joseph, a Christian farmer here, and 12 of his workers recently came very close to losing their lives. I saw death in my eyes. We're concealing his identity because he lives among Hezbollah supporters. The farm sits near the South Lebanon border, close to the Israeli town of Metula. Since the Hamas October 7th attack, his village and adjacent farm have come under constant Israeli shelling. March 13th, they were on the farm when Israel struck. Two minutes after reaching the farm, they hit us with a 120-millimeter mortar. I got hit by a shrapnel on my arm, and when the second mortar was coming, I told the guys to hit the ground and stay flat. It landed 30 meters away from us. Here is why Israel often targets his and other nearby farms. CBN News has obtained exclusive pictures and videos showing how Hezbollah today here in the southern part of Lebanon is using farms owned by Christians in order to launch their missile attacks against Israel. Joseph took these images a few days after that strike, showing multiple Hezbollah missile systems in the middle of his olive grove. They keep using our land as a launching pad. They assemble their missiles here, then fire them into Israel. He's been losing money since daily border fights erupted five months ago. We don't want our land to be a staging ground for war between these two parties. We take no part in this. What's happening in Gaza is not our war. Joseph says he's repeatedly asked the Lebanese army to intervene, hoping to stop Hezbollah fighters from using his farm, but to no avail. South Lebanon is under Hezbollah control, and Joseph says Lebanese authorities have little sway over the terrorist group. We have become accustomed to these strikes happening to us because we live close to the Israeli borders. Sadly, we have no say in peace or war. We Christians always pay the price. Since war began in Gaza, Hezbollah has fired more than 3,000 rockets at Israeli civilian and military targets forcing the evacuation of more than 150,000 civilians on both sides of the Israel-Lebanon border. The more the war goes on, the more I lose money. Israel and the Lebanese government came to an agreement recently that would allow Christian farmers to work on their properties during certain times of the week. Joseph says he's not taking any chances. After cheating death once, I don't dare to go to my farm again. George Thomas, CBN News, South Lebanon. Still ahead and here at home, congressional Republicans taking the next step on impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, saying he isn't protecting the southern border. We're going to bring you the story. It's coming up right after this. Congressional Republicans have delivered articles of impeachment for the Secretary of Homeland Security to the Senate. The lawmakers say Alejandro Mayorkas has failed to protect the U.S.'s southern border. Shelley Aaron is on the story. Two House Republicans walked the articles of impeachment through the U.S. Capitol Tuesday, led by the House Clerk and Sergeant at Arms, setting in motion a potential trial to remove Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas from office. GOP House members accused Mayorkas of violating the Constitution by refusing to enforce border security laws. Earlier, Mayorkas faced tough questions from House members on the department's budget. CBN News national security correspondent Caitlin Burke followed the hearing. This scheduled appropriations discussion felt more like a literal trial run of what would be heard in any Senate impeachment proceeding. Lawmakers immediately fired accusations against Secretary Mayorkas, including that he's failed to fulfill his oath to protect the United States. You refuse to comply with the laws passed by Congress, and you've breached the public trust. You facilitated and encouraged record levels of illegal immigration since your first day in office. Congress has not updated our immigration enforcement laws since 1996, 28 years ago. And 
Only Congress can deliver on our need for more Border Patrol agents, asylum officers, and immigration judges, facilities, and technology. While trying to oust Mayorkas, Speaker Mike Johnson is facing a challenge of his own, as some House Republicans threatened to expel him after he outlined a plan to send assistance to Ukraine. Representative Thomas Massey, a strong critic of additional Ukraine aid, says he'll join Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene in her motion to vacate the speaker's chair, a move that could set up a floor vote to oust Johnson. After Iraq, announcing his decision to, to his Republican America colleagues, Congressman Massey posted on X, quote, he should pre-announce his resignation so we can pick a new speaker without ever being without a GOP speaker an idea the House Speaker quickly rejected. I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. Despite the growing threats from within his party, Speaker Johnson is moving forward several foreign aid bills on the House floor this week in an effort to aid Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Coming up, the film telling the true story of a community in the 19th century as they learn to trust in God and the beginning of a movement of faith all around the world. We're going to bring you the story when we come back. Stay with us. Introducing a brand new way to start your morning, the CBN News Quick Start Podcast. Each weekday morning at 7 a.m., get quick highlights of the day's important news, then an in-depth analysis that goes beyond the headlines, insights that matter to people of faith. Discover how God is moving around the world and here at home. Find the CBN News Quick Start Podcast on iTunes or wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts, because truth matters. The Hopeful is the inspiring true story of a 19th century community learning what it means to trust in Jesus. And it is the start of a new worldwide movement of faith. I sat down with the film's director and producer, Kyle Portberry, for a closer look at the film. Obey his word and believe. There is no time for delay. I believe the Bible is clear. Jesus will return in but four short years. Why was this film personal for you? I understand it was. What what, what happened? For me, when I got the opportunity to tell their story, I looked at it and I went, well, you've got to personalize it, right? Like, who are these people? And would I have wanted to, A, spend time with them? Mm -hmm. And also, how how do I relate to them? Are they relatable? Is there a way that I can find that makes them people just like me? This is not the first time the end of the world has been prophesied by a fool, nor will it be the last. They argue with each other. Mm -hmm. They get mad at each other. (laughs) They get upset. They feel damaged and hurt from time to time. They're related by things that they're doing or involved in. And so all of a sudden you go, oh, okay, I can tell this story now. Right? These are people that I get. If you do not renounce these radical ideas, you will not be welcome here in this house of worship. There's very big similarities between the early 1800s and right now. That said, who do you think you most relate to in this story? Which character? Uh, I think Elizabeth, the sister. Hmm. Her visions do not come from God. But my friends, she speaks with great tenderness of the word of the Lord. I always think, yeah, I think it's easy to assume that we would be the people who hold on and persevere. Um, I think it's really important to realize that you have the capacity for the opposite. I come before you today to tell you that I have been shown in vision. Father Miller's message was light. The Advent people were traveling on a path toward a bright and holy city. For people coming to this story blind and not necessarily of faith, How would you describe William Miller? Who is he? He's a fascinating guy, right? Like he goes off to the War of 1812 and he has this experience where a shell lands in the middle of his company, kills everybody around him, but not him. And he does that classic thing that we would all do in that situation and he goes, why me? Mm -hmm. 
Um, what happened in his own words as he found a friend in Jesus, it's that he didn't give up trying to discover why him. There were people who didn't listen and they fell off the path. Do you believe this doctrine which you preach? I was lost and now I'm found. What's your hope for the hopeful? The people will walk out feeling that they can offer that same hope and healing that they see in the film and through the characters in their own sphere of influence, in their own part of the world. If you persevere, even in your own little area of the world, mm -hmm. there is an impact for good and a hope that you can bring and a healing that you can offer, which if all it does is make someone go, why are you like that? We must follow the word of God over the rule of men. Non-Christians expect Christians to be judgmental and God is going to get you for those things, you know. What would happen if we walked out of the cinema and we gave them the opposite of that? I, I think that's my hope for the hopeful, is that we'll be inspired to offer hope and healing to others. We feel love, the love of Jesus. It lifts us up, it carries us forward. And it will guide us home. The Hopeful is in theaters nationwide for two nights only. That is tonight, which is April 17th, and tomorrow night, April 18th. And be sure to join us this evening for a special edition of Studio 5. We're taking a deep dive into the film One Life. It is the true story of a British stockbroker who helps to rescue more than 600 children from the grip of Nazis. We're going to be talking to the film's director and two members of the cast. You can watch the all-new episode of Studio 5 tonight on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app, or you can watch it on YouTube. Time now for your Wednesday word, and today's word is trust. It's inspired by the lyrics of a song that's been playing in my head for the last few days. I trust in God. He is my savior. He is the one who can never fail. To that I add, God won't leave you and he won't fail. With that word, I wish you a wonderful Wednesday and be sure to have yourself a wonderful rest of the week. That will do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online. That address is CBNNews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can do that by emailing us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye. God bless.